morning, Rolling Roads Baptist Church. Best wishes to those who are dealing with technical difficulties. And in our bulletin today, we have an insert, which is very nice, which is the Piedmont International Fellowship inviting you to Fashion with a Purpose Accessories Sale, which is coming up soon in April, April 22nd. So you want to keep this flyer if you're interested. And what they're doing is uh, collecting new or gently used accessories. <clears throat> now, how many of you men have a lot of accessories <clears throat> that you may not be using? So um, this would be a great time to make those benefit a good cause. I know one person who does have a lot of accessories in many different locations that could probably be uh, donated here to raise money for this. And then there's also Love Life, uh, which is available for your participation in prayer. And um, there's been some, also some prayer requests in the PBA, uh, specifically uh, over at uh, Lawndale Baptist Church being mentioned again for the fifth time this morning. Um, one of their, as you may know, their um, pastor for seniors passed away um, this past week, and they had the service, I uh, believe, on Saturday, and also uh, Pastor Jeff, the children's minister there for many years, had a very major surgery, I uh, believe, on Friday, but we need to continue to be in prayer uh, for that uh, church and that ministry team there, and there's many other prayer requests, too, that have gone on. Um, the church office will be closed tomorrow in observance of President's Day. And I believe up on the screen there might be a, uh, or there was earlier, is it still there? It matches the bulletin, doesn't it? Look, it actually matches the bulletin. So that's, um, for those of you that don't recognize him, that's President Washington over there <laughs> and President Lincoln over there. And I don't think either one of them was Baptist. So. But you can still celebrate President's Day because I know at least one of them through the years was a Baptist. So um, with that, from forgetting anything, uh, enjoy your worship. Chapel to worship you. 
We do ask, Lord, that you would guide us and lead us by your Holy Spirit. We do pray for our courage to continue to pray for those on our prayer list and the needs which continue there. There are so many young people on the list who deal with difficulties and medical challenges. And we can think of several right now. And we just pray, Lord, that you would heal them and give them comfort. We pray for those who are dealing with medical situations that are maybe undiagnosed or not diagnosed enough. We pray for those who are still feeling that they should stay home because they feel unsafe being outside of their homes. We pray, Lord, that you would give them courage. And we ask, Lord, that you would be with our first responders. We hear the sirens all week long. And we see the ambulances and fire engines and police cars. And we just pray, Lord, that you would be with those people. And indeed, be with those who are affected by crime and illegal activity and accidents. We just pray, Lord, that you would protect the innocent and deliver them from their trouble. We pray, Lord, for this neighborhood and all the people that live around here, those who are homeless, those who are having difficulties in various ways. We pray for the ministries that are within a mile of this church, the food pantry and the clothes closet and the other things that uh, are trying to stay open. We just ask, Lord, that you would deal with all the needs that are here. So, Lord, we do love you this morning. We profess our dependence on you and our need for you. And we ask, Lord, that you would be with us as we worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First praise song is Have Faith in God. We will sing the first verse. Stand as we sing. Oh 
on. We thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for watching over us. Thank you for this church, and we thank you for our pastor as he preaches the word. Lord, we ask that you be with those who are uh, not well this morning, those who are uh, ill, those who are recovering, uh, those who need your tender care. We just thank you, Father, for your protection and blessings upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus rises to the occasion 
and deals with it like the Savior would. So we'll read the verses and then we'll pray. Matthew chapter 17, verses 24 through 27. And you'll have to pardon my voice. I'm somehow I'm having an allergy attack here for the last uh, half hour. So I'm getting all stopped up and everything. So Matthew 17, beginning at verse 24. When they came to Capernaum, those who collected the two drachma tax came to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the two drachma tax? He said, Yes. When he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth collect customs or poll tax? From their sons or from strangers? Then Peter said, From strangers? Jesus said to him, Then the sons are exempt. However, so that we do not offend them, go to the sea and throw in a hook and take the first fish that comes up, and when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for you and me. Let's pray together. Lord, we do. <clears throat> we thank you for the fish of the sea. And we thank you, Lord, for your provision for us. And we thank you, Lord, for your concern for others and for your relationship to us. We thank you, Lord, for all you have given to bring us to you. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to understand your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Boy. So Jesus came to Capernaum. Some people pronounce it Capernaum. That's the place right there. Almost nobody says Capernaum. That would be incorrect. But Capernaum, that's a little picture of the archaeological site there. And uh, right by the Sea of Galilee. It's a beautiful place. The disciples had been gathering in Galilee at this point in Matthew's Gospel. And this was just after, in, in chapter 17, you'll see, if you look up earlier in the verses, just after his transfiguration on the mountain. And I remember when I was a kid, I heard about the transfiguration of Jesus. I thought, what in the world is that all about? And, and well, uh, you see what happened there is he, he was transfigured before them in Matthew 17, 2, and his face shone like the sun and his garments became as white as light. So that's what we know the transfiguration was. That's about all we know. And that had just happened recently. And here they are gathering at Capernaum up in Galilee, probably at Peter's house. And Peter's house archaeological site is underneath that big uh, round looking building there. And the other building on this side is the synagogue at Capernaum. So Jesus had told them again that the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him and he will be raised on the third day. He told them all this. And Capernaum here has been functioning kind of like Jesus' headquarters, so to speak, a prominent uh, city at that time in Galilee, fishing village. So the disciples had come to Capernaum, verse 24. And the next thing that happens is these, we could say, tax collectors came to Peter. And they come up to him, and they're interested in discussing this tax, the two drachma tax. Peter Simon Peter was the leader of the disciples and he must have been recognized as that way by other people. And, and you know, they come up to, to Peter to ask him and, and there was a problem with dealing with Jesus himself, you know, at this point. Some people were trying to avoid him because he was uh, getting on people's cases and uh, making them feel funny. So they, they decide to approach 
Peter is being a little more safe. And yet you see how bold they are. They're coming. Uh, the wording is like a challenge. You know, that old, that silly old saying, have you stopped beating your wife yet? You know, it's like a challenge to his face. It's like, does your, does your teacher not pay the two drachma tax? Well, you know, they're already offended, right? They're already uh, upset. And they come to challenge Simon Peter as a representative of Jesus. They seem almost like government officials with an agenda. You know, they come to trap you. But these guys aren't really from the government per se. But they were probably put up to this by the Sanhedrin. Maybe they wanted to come up and, and uh, just find something wrong and like, aha, now we've got him. Excavations have shown that a prominent officer of King Herod lived at Capernaum, probably lived nearby. And these people have concerns that are kind of like political concerns. Because, as we'll talk about, the payment of this tax was important to the Jews. And they may have been looking for some excuse to hand him over to the Romans. And, you know, we asked the question, did they find the reason? Did they find a reason to hand him over to the Romans? Was it yet Jesus' time? And I do see in my Bible... There are a few more chapters in the Gospel of Matthew. So this particular tax, the two drachma tax, that is, if I remember correctly, that's a shekel, which is equal to two drachmas put together. And this particular tax was a temple tax. So some people refer to this as the temple tax, which was, uh, according to scholars, on every Jewish male between the ages of 20 and 50, so once you're 50, you don't have to pay it anymore, in support of the temple in Jerusalem and its services. Now, this tax originated way back in Exodus chapter 30, verse 13, when Israel had first crossed the Jordan. That's where it kind of arises from. And, of course, what happens with taxes? What happens with fees? The amount got larger as the years went by. Imagine that. And also what happened, according to some information, is that it moved and changed from being a contribution into being a tax. So it was, you know, optional kind of for a while, and then it got to be more and more required. The interesting thing about this that people still fight over is that this tax was not sanctioned officially by the Roman law. The Romans, this was not a Roman tax. It really wasn't even a government tax. But the Romans understood this tax and they allowed the Jews to collect it. So there's a little background on what's going on. It's a, it's a loaded subject, this idea of the tax. And so, what were they expecting when they come to talk to Peter? Were they expecting to hear a yes, or were they expecting to hear a no? What do you think they were thinking? Uh, it seems like they were probably expecting to hear a, a no. You know, my rabbi is different. My rabbi is above it all. And my rabbi has nothing to do with you, you, you tax collectors or whatever, even though we know he did. Peter gives him a short answer nonetheless. Don't you love his, his answer? He said yes, verse 25. <laughs> he said yes. Very short, about as short as you can make it. One word, one word response. Now, it could be that Peter just assumed that Jesus paid the tax because everybody did. What I thought initially was that Peter is just automatically trusting Jesus' integrity. He's like, well, why wouldn't he? Or, you know, why not? You know, why wouldn't he pay the tax? Because Jesus has integrity. Peter knows Jesus is God at this point. He's just seen him 
transfigured on the mountain, you know, it's obviously dealing with God here. Now, I doubt, though, I just personally, I doubt Peter actually knew for sure. It just seems to me like Peter doesn't really know for sure. He just says, yes, of course he does. And then he's like, no, oh, does he? And then he's probably going back in the house to go, hey, uh, do you pay the temple tax? You know, it's like he's not quite sure. I doubt Peter knew about Jesus' finances because Judas was the accountant, remember? All you accountants, remember? Judas was the accountant. So Peter was probably avoiding a showdown or a conflict, you know, with these, these people that came up. Those who collected the tax came up. You know, how do you feel when the tax collector comes to your house? Uh, Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Jones, uh, we have a problem with your your uh, return, your tax return. How would you? How do you feel? You get the notice of audit. Does it come in a pink envelope or a green envelope or a red envelope? I don't even know. How does it? How does it show up? I don't know. I think it can be pretty scary though when they want to audit you. Don't you think? So he's he's avoiding this. It seems like a religious question, kind of. But it's almost a political question, a political challenge. It could almost be like a social issue. Is Jesus a good Jew or not? Does Jesus support the temple or not? That, my friends, is the real question. That is the real question of this uh, question. The One commentator says the question is, how pro-temple are you, Jesus? How pro-temple are you? Are you in favor of the temple institution way down south in Judea? So the question is a test, is a challenge to see if Jesus is cooperative or not. And so Peter goes back in the house. There's uh, Peter from... And there's... there's kind of hard to show you this, but this is the Peter's house archaeological site before the cover was put on. This is a picture from way back in the 90s, I think. And there's a lot of stuff going on here. Suffice it to say, there are ancient churches built on top of the original walls of the house. Does that make sense? So the octagonal structure you see, or hexagonal, or whatever, that's a church. A very, very, very old church. And the straight line walls under it that are going kind of this way and that way represent the original structure. Some of you may not have known Peter had a house. But Peter goes back in the house. And Jesus and you know others are there. Now, did Jesus know what was going on outside? The text makes us, uh, you know, clearly Jesus spoke first, right? And Peter addressed him as Simon, not a Peter. And that the Matthew keeps referring to him as Peter, which is all great. And I think Jesus is speaking informally. So he says, so what do you think about this? It's similar to the question of Jesus' identity. Back in Matthew 16, when Jesus says in verse 13, who do people say the Son of Man is? And then in verse 15, he said to them, but who do you say that I am. What do you think is going on here, Peter? What do you think about the two drachma attacks? So Jesus is omniscient, of course, here. Knows he knows what's going on. He's using that attribute of all-knowing, and he anticipates what Peter is going to say, and in loving fashion, teaching fashion, Jesus offers and poses a parable to all of them, I think. And he seems to be addressing it to Simon, but he's, he's talking to everyone. And this parable is, what do you think? From whom do the kings of the earth collect customs or poll tax from their sons or from strangers? Who do they collect taxes from? And it has this obvious answer. The answer is weighty, as Peter says, from strangers, from strangers. So Jesus here is 
bringing up two groups. He's dividing people once again into sons and strangers. What's the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian? Smart Alex today would say, well, there's no difference. <laughs> there can't be a difference. Jesus says there is a difference. The two groups polarized in their relationships to the kings of the earth, collecting a tax or a fee in this context. Jesus is implying that it's a negative thing to do to someone. You're collecting money from them. You know, Roman taxes... If we think about the real government taxes of this day, are like a judgment upon Israel from the kings of the earth that the Jews asked for back in history, and now they're paying the price during this time for all of their corruption. And they're saying uh, that it's a, it's a, Jesus is like implying that they are not sons. If the Romans are not collecting taxes from the Jews, then they're not sons of the Romans. And the temple tax was almost considered like an offering to God, one that was expected to be paid from all upstanding Jewish men. And so here is Jesus in the house, having been transfigured before them, being tested by this seemingly trivial ancient social practice. Don't you believe in the temple tax? So there's two groups in Jesus' parable, the sons and the strangers, and the difference is one pays the taxes, the other does not. One owes, one is in debt and owes, and the other doesn't. One is judged, and the other is, as Jesus says in verse 26, you can translate it, free. Some of you have a note in your margin. Uh, verse 26, the sons are exempt or the sons are free. They're free. Hmm. Who are these sons that are free? I like the way he's mentioning, he's using the male language there. You know, the tax is paid by males only. So then he's talking about sons. I think that's ironic. And who are the sons that are free? Well, it certainly is Jesus, since he is the Son of God. And the temple tax is considered required by God, Jesus' his Father. So by extension, the disciples are probably also sons. Do you see his point? His Father's house, he said when he cleansed the temple. He called it his Father's house. And he chided the money changers. And he made a whip. And he chided them. And he cleansed the temple. And he said, you, this is my Father's house. And here they come to collect taxes from the Son of God. What do they think they're doing? They don't know what they're doing, but the disciples ought to see what they're doing. The disciples ought to understand the incredible irony of this whole thing. The irony, irony in their request. Does Jesus pay the two drachma tax? They ought to be ashamed of themselves. But the Jews are not free. They're not exempt because they're collecting the tax ostensibly for the Father. And so Jesus' parable is sarcastically implying that they are not sons who are paying the tax. They're paying the taxes to Rome at the same time. So is this tax really any different so Jesus is proving to Simon Peter and his disciples that he doesn't need to pay the tax since he is the Son of God and he really is above it all and the tax really is irrelevant to what is actually going on. And further, here's what the point really is. Here's Matthew's real point and Jesus' real point is that he is the one who is greater than the temple and any tax that could support it. He is the true temple. Jesus is the temple. And he's also teaching that there is a division in Israel. I think this play on the words there that Jesus says were uh, exempt or free. He's teaching that there is a division between those who repent as part of true Israel and those who refuse. Those who are all concerned 
with their ancient religious practices and yet neglect worship of the Son of God who has been transfigured. Romans 9, 6 says, They are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. And my friends, that is a really rough point. And he's making it very clear to them. And this gives us also a view of how Jesus fulfills the law anyway regarding the support of the temple. He himself is the ceremonial law. The temple is over and the true temple is here and that is Jesus. And so in verse 27, what we see then, Jesus does graciously, and I said magnanimously, says this word, however. And isn't this just a great, great snapshot of his whole ministry? As how, how people just miss the point, miss him completely, continue to make themselves worthy of God's judgment, and yet Jesus says, however, so that we do not offend them. He doesn't want to offend them and make them stumble. You may have the literal translation. So that we don't cause them to stumble. So that we don't wipe them out. He works a miracle for the purpose. And who is we and who is them? The sons that are free, Jesus and Peter, at least that is, Jesus and his disciples, so that we don't offend those to whom we are ministering. You say, well, there's different kinds of fish in the sea, right? Jesus is referencing the two groups symbolized in the parable. And which king are we talking about here? We're not talking about Caesar. Jesus is teaching that the sons of God are exempt, but not from taxes, not from the temple tax or the Roman taxes, for they are strangers to the world from the world's perspective. The irony continues. Jesus is acknowledging that he and all who follow him will be strangers to the world, but they will be sons of God. They are citizens of a greater temple, a greater city, a greater country and the king of that country will not take taxes and tribute from his sons. And Peter goes to the sea. His instructions for a miracle prove Jesus' care for the disciples, for his own glory, for his own reputation among men, and even his care for those who have asked for the two temple tax and for all who pay it still as the temple still stands. He doesn't work the miracle because he has to. <laughs> Jesus works the miracle because he wants to. And it is remarkable how Jesus builds Peter up and then says the sons are exempt, right? He's, what do you think, son? Like Peter saying, I'm right, I'm right, but uh, well, no, I'm wrong. He's like, of course I pay the taxes. Of course Jesus pays the taxes. But then Jesus is like, Simon, do we pay the taxes? Well, of course not. Oh, yeah, no, yeah, we do. Yeah, no, no, we do. <laughs> but then at the end, what do you think Peter's thinking? Phew, he does pay the tax. Phew, he does pay the tax. And then I get to go sport fishing for profit. Ultimately, what happens? Peter throws in a a hook, and the tax is paid. Ultimately, Jesus provides sonship, forgiveness, obedience, all of this for his own children by his obedience as the Son of God, so we too become children of light. We, people who repent and have faith in him, we are the ones that are exempt, and we are certainly free from his judgment upon sin if we repent and believe in Jesus as Savior. So in this passage, we can be happy that there is a motive for Christians paying ungodly taxes so as to not give offense. And I might add also so we don't go to jail. So Jesus' humility and his magnanimity is shown, and yet he is the one who was transfigured before them. 
He's genuinely concerned, I think, about not giving offense to his enemies or, you know, those who challenge him or those to whom he is still ministering. So his humility and his ability are here contrasted in an amazing way. And his timing and his chronology are important here, too, because Jesus is challenging his own followers not to use their strength as sons, but to be meek as Jesus himself was meek. And we know that Christ will inherit the earth in the future because the meek will inherit the earth. And there's a right time for everything. And Jesus' miracle shows his power over nature, his power, uh, his omniscience, and his knowing all things. And it's pretty weird to know that there's a, 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 a shekel in the mouth of a fish, right? Power over currency and money, provider of all that is needed. Jesus is God. He's running the world in detail. And here we do see an amazing, amazing detail. And he asks him, would you like to worship Peter? You don't need to support the temple in Jerusalem, which is corrupt and is passing away. Worship Jesus, the one who is with you all the way. The one whom you have seen transfigured, the one that you will see crucified as well. So besides all this, as we said, the Lord is endorsing sport fishing for profit. We must observe that they usually use nets at Capernaum, but Peter has a hook. And we can hope that Peter tied that hook to a number six line, right? We can hope. Did he have a sinker? Did he have a cork? Did he have a bobber? What did he have? We only know he had a hook. And most of us would love to have the fish swim up and bite a bare hook. Boy, I hope that's not what happened. I hope Simon Peter put a worm on there anyway just to be practical about it. <laughs> Don't you? The fact is that God worked the miracles. We are free because Jesus has made us sons and daughters of the great king. He teaches us that the temple in Jerusalem that they paid money to support does not provide the sonship, forgiveness, and the freedom from judgment. But greater, the one greater than the temple is among them. The one to whom that temple pointed and all of its ministry and functions, at least it was supposed to. So the bottom line is, are we in a personal relationship with the Son are we therefore children of God ourselves? Only by individual personal faith in Christ Jesus will we receive this forgiveness, this ultimate exemption from the judgment of God, this true freedom. Don't ever replace the true temple Christ with our own ceremonial laws and any other outward show of religion. He cannot be replaced and never assume that just being a good citizen means you're going to heaven. It's about repentance and faith. It's about forgiveness, your relationship to God. Have you been forgiven? That's the essential thing. Jesus offers forgiveness. So we don't worry about being strangers in the world. Jesus was willing to identify with his challengers in hopes of winning them over, and we can too. He was willing to be the Son of God, continuing to teach with his life. And today Jesus says to all people, come to me, uh, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace on those who challenge you daily with their sinful behavior. We pray, Lord, that we would repent, that we would have faith, that we would trust in you for our salvation. For it is in Jesus' name we pray.
worship. Go with the Holy Spirit out into the world. And remember to always be happy because of Jesus, the risen Son of God who speaks the truth. Amen and go in peace. Thank you all for coming today.